everybody. I'm Brian Norcross. Luke Doris is still on weather duty, but he'll be back here on the podcast soon. This is podcast number six of Hurricane Season 2020, and it's number 44 in our series. Today, we're going to talk to Dr. Adam Sobel of Columbia University in New York. Adam is professor of applied physics and mathematics and of environmental science. He also has a great podcast of his own called Deep Convection. That's a convection. That's a slightly fancy meteorological term for tall thunderstorms in a tropical system. Adam talks to scientists, mostly atmospheric scientists, about getting to be a scientist and the state of science. Really interesting. I'm looking forward to our uh, conversation. And of course, these past several days, we've been all about Isaias. Turned out to be a practice run for Florida, but an important part of its history has yet to be written. As we're recording this, it's just about to make landfall right near the South Carolina and North Carolina line. The center of uh, Isaias is offshore, but the weather is already onshore. And on the right side, mostly on the North Carolina coast, it's going to be pushing storm surge ashore, which is uh, significant. And they've uh, had some evacuations from that. And we just hope that Everybody got out that needed to get out because the storm is intensifying here in the hours just before it's making landfall. And the big difference with Isa Isis now that compared to the way it was in Florida is that now we have this unusually strong jet stream that's approaching from the west in a big uh, sharp dip in the jet stream pushing toward the coast and that's meeting Isa uh, Isis there and so that's enhancing the rain on the west side and there's a flooding threat there, flash flood threat in a big streak all the way from the Carolinas all the way up to New England. So the most important thing that that jet stream is going to do is going to enhance the, on the western side, the inland side, the significant rainfall. The other thing it's going to do, it's going to propel Isaias north, make it move fast, and that's going to keep the wind speeds up when it moves through the northeast on Tuesday. So Tuesday is going to be the day for most of the northeast and then exiting New England on Wednesday, and then that'll be it for Isa Isis. But this is going to be a significant event moving through uh, the Northeast, and no doubt there's going to be power knocked out and some issues at the coast for people that are not uh, properly protected. The good thing is it is moving fast, so the effects should be minimized by that. But still, uh, it's a pretty strong storm. It's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, in New York City as well. That wind is really going to blow up the avenues when that center uh, goes on by. Now, over the weekend, there was a battle royal between the storm, Isaias, and the dry air and the hostile upper winds. Now, of course, we all know now that the dry air and the upper winds won the battle, held Isaias offshore just enough that there really was not a significant effect uh, along the coast. The wobbles that uh, were caused by that unbalanced storm worked out perfectly for the Florida coast and, and, uh, the question is, can we count on that? One of the questions I want to ask Professor Sobel is, will we ever be able to forecast wobbles like that? I kind of doubt it, but we'll see what he has to say. Now that we're into August, the hurricane season really kicks in, of course. We talked to Phil Klotzbach about this last week on the podcast. He remembered back at Colorado State, the great Dr. Bill Gray, who was the famous forecaster of hurricane seasons. He created hurricane season forecasting at Colorado State. He was to ring a bell on August 20th as the official beginning of the peak of hurricane season every year. And indeed, it is. The two months from October, uh, August 20th to October 20th is the peak here in South Florida. In our record book, it turns out in August, there was only one hurricane that hit South Florida before the date that Hurricane Andrew hit on the 24th. And that happened in 1888 on August 16th. There was a hurricane that came through here. So the odds say that for the first half of August, we should be good. But of course, the odds aren't always right. And we'll see. We're recording this podcast on Monday, August 3rd, 2020. If you're listening at some point in the future, you've got to tune in to Local 10 in South Florida on Channel 10, of course, or Local 10 uh, dot com, where all of the Local 10 newscasts are streamed live and free. So 
if you're out of town or if you don't have TV anymore, which some people don't, you can go to Local10.com and you can watch uh, Local10 News anytime. Or you can get the Max Tracker Hurricane app or the Local10 Weather Authority app for, of course, current information. So let's bring in Dr. Adam Sobel of Columbia University. Adam is Professor of Applied Physics and Applied Mathematics and of Earth and Environmental Science, which, of course, includes weather and climate. Adam is especially interested in extreme weather, of which, of course, we are as well. He's also an author. He wrote a book about Hurricane Sandy, and as I mentioned, is the host of a podcast called Deep Convection, which is essentially about being a scientist, and it's I found it absolutely fascinating. Adam has an outstanding ability to put scientific and technical concepts into words and descriptions that everyday people can understand and relate to. So let's say hello to Adam Sobel. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. So you're in New York City, right? Yeah. Uh, are people there paying any attention to Isaias? It's kind of coming that way, and I assume it's going to be kind of gusty, uh, up the avenues, especially in the afternoon, I think. Yeah, honestly, I don't know what people are. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's a pandemic. We're all kind of still not I know, uh, I know. in touch in the way we used to be. I mean, I'm talking to my family and friends about it, and I think that although some of them had a vague notion that it was coming, as you know better than I do, the forecast for here is suddenly a little more more serious than it was yesterday. So I, I think, uh, you know, we, we could see a little more impact. So I don't know. I think I think people's awareness of it might be a little bit below where maybe it might be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can bet people are going to be surprised. I know people in New York kind of look out the window and then go about their business and don't think too hard about it. Right. I mean, that's just life in the city. I spent a lot of time in New York City myself. So I think I became aware of you after Hurricane, later Superstorm Sandy, uh, but yeah. I, I can't remember now if it was before your book on Sandy or maybe it was during Sandy and, and all the email traffic and, and so forth that was going on. By the way, I, I love the book. I read it in 2014 and oh, thank you. it was, was uh, terrific. And it was uh, uh, you write very, very clearly. I love that. And then recently I stumbled across somehow, I don't know, across your podcast, Deep Convection, about scientists and science and and how scientists become scientists and and I thought it was just so uh, creative I really enjoyed that and I I learned something from one of your podcasts that we have in common and okay. that is that your father worked for Philco and my father worked for Philco as well Philco Philco no it must be somebody else's father my father's oh. a lawyer oh is that right well who was it maybe one of your guests father worked for Philco what? wait what's Philco was that radio engineering yes it was a, it was an electronics company now that's so funny yeah I think that was Mark Kane's father oh maybe that was it oh, okay 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 um yes anyway so um my father worked for Philco he was an electrical engineer and that was how I became kind of a math and science-y uh kind of person you know way back then uh, so let's go back to ECS just a minute. The Florida coast here was saved by um, uh, this jog, this little wobble in the track that happened. Of course, it's not uncommon for storms to wobble, even intense storms wobble, maybe for different reasons than this weak one that had a, a big cluster of thunderstorms on one side and winds blowing over the top of it. So I raised the question earlier here in the podcast before I introduced you. Do you think we'll ever be able to forecast those wobbles? Yesterday morning, it was heading right for the Palm Beach County coast, wobbled to the right, changed the whole complexion of the threat. Is, is, do you think that's ever going to be possible, or is it down to the question of forecastability and chaos and all that kind of thing? That's a really good question. <laughs> I mean, it is down to that question. I mean, that's the question you're asking, right, mm -hmm, is right. what is predictable down to what scale? And it's like if there's tropical convection on what we call, you know, the mesoscale or, or even, the, you know, the small end of the mesoscale and it, um, how far in advance can it be predicted? I mean, surely it can be predicted on a short time scale, right? There's some, if, if it, you know, a few hours before when it starts to happen, if you get a plane through there and you can see it in the radar, I mean, there's got to be some, but the question is, can you predict it at, you know, a day or a few days? Yeah, and, so, so this, this thunderstorm activity, so-called convection, to use <laughs> your deep convection word. And it was really deep and tall and, and 
uh, big, big blow-ups there on the east side. I mean, they are, uh, the Hurricane Center analyzed them to be happening about every eight hours, right? And finally, they kind of got with the rhythm, right? And and yeah. and kind of used that rhythm to kind of forecast uh, when it was going to re-intensify and when it was going to weaken. But I don't. How would you ever, ever? I mean, ever forecast that 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 was going to happen in advance? You know, like like the day before even that it was going to do that on an eight-hour schedule. Well, yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, because I read that, too, in the discussions where they were saying, like, I mean, there's no, as far as I know, there's no particular scientific reason that we know of or precedent for an eight-hour eight hour cycle. I mean, there's, like, diurnal cycles that are 24 hours, and there's, you know, but they just sort of, you're right, they just sort of saw that happening and said, oh, well, let's keep going with it, which <laughs> yeah. is an interesting way to forecast. I mean, but I think... Persistence, you know, right? I think the question is, you know, could numerical models catch it could the guidance which is new computer models initialized with data that's informed by uh all the data that they have the satellites and in, in the case of the atlantic the hurricane hunter uh flights and the radar and the drop zones and so on like if you feed all that to the models could they get it you know a day or several days in advance somehow man i don't know you know it's um i think that's i'm not completely read up on the literature on that but my sense is it's at the edge of what may or may not be possible like the predictability horizon mm -hmm. um and it's wrapped up not, you know not just in track wobbles but i think intensity too exactly intensity forecast too are going to depend on that same kind of thing um and i think my sense of the research what we're seeing is that with you know the with the the radar um images from the and the data from the flights if you mm -hmm. can assimilate it well enough quick enough you can get a little more predictability than we had a few years ago I and mean, the intensity forecasts mm -hmm. do seem to be improving a bit and i suppose these track wobbles are being done the same kind of thing but i i don't think we know the really the answer to your question how far in advance could we do it yeah i so i asked the folks at the hurricane research division noah's hurricane research division where you have people really trying to think out these problems here in miami uh, this question, like, uh, okay, we're doing all this work. We think there's progress in forecasting intensity, but it feels like it's kind of on a knife's edge, you know, and and feels like there are, are things in nature and just in the universe that are on a knife's edge. And, and uh, by the definition of that, the predictability has got to be lower because the smallest thing can make it go the other way. And, and I, you know, uh, to me, this is such a fundamental issue in uh, the future of weather forecasting and even maybe even climate forecasting. Yeah, no, I think you're right. But I, I think it's partly a science issue per se and partly a communication issue, right? Because mm -hmm. it could be that we'll never have accurate, you know, deterministic forecasts of this kind of stuff multiple days ahead of time. But it could be that we get a little bit more of a clue of what the possibilities are and the, what the probabilities are, and that careful communication of that could, if, if the user, if the public learns to understand that, and my sense is that the weather service overall is a little shy about exposing people to that kind of information. I think people don't understand probabilities. But if we could, you know, that there might be a little more, even, even the, if, even if a deterministic forecast isn't possible, but maybe a probabilistic forecast that are a little bit better than what we have now could be. Yeah, the well, the issue of probabilities is really a difficult thing because I mean, people live in a deterministic world, right? They're either going to evacuate or they're not going to evacuate. You can't 30% evacuate. So you, you really live in a thresholdy world, right? So if the probability is over a certain amount and if it's an extreme event, that number is low. I, I say to people all the time, if there was a 20% chance of you or your family being injured by, by this storm, would you take action? And of course, everybody says, yes, it's a 10% chance. Well, yes. Uh, how about a 5%? You know, where's the limit that your, uh, your threshold for taking action, if it's an extreme event, it's a pretty low number you know, yeah. in, the, in the single digits, right? So, yeah. you know, because it's so low, it kind of becomes deterministic in a way if, if the event is extreme. It's in these kind of situations where it wasn't an extreme event. Nobody thought it was going to be, you know, a, a big old terrible Category 3 or 4 hurricane uh, that 
it gets more difficult, I think, to explain. Well, I mean, you're right that decisions are binary. I mean, people mm -hmm. have to make a decision to do X or not to do X, to evacuate or not to evacuate. But I think people have some understanding of probabilities, right? I mean, everybody knows there's uncertainties and things that could happen. People buy insurance, you know, people make. So, I mean, they may not, you know, we may not know how to put a number on it, like what's the probability at which some particular degree of extreme event is going to make me do something. But I think, you know, I think people do have some sense of it. And I think sometimes um, we could communicate it a little more. I mean, the example, maybe not so much with the hurricanes, but we've had, you know, a few snowstorms in the last, I don't know, five years, 10 mm -hmm. years in yeah. New York City, where there was a big forecast of a big snowstorm and it didn't happen. And, you know, they said two feet and we get three inches and people are upset. But, you know, the, the, the forecasters knew that it might be three inches. And if right. you dug in the web page, you could find that, that was a possibility. But they didn't want to tell people that because they feel they have to give a number. Whereas if you told people, you know, it could be two feet or it might be three inches, like maybe some people could use that. I don't know. Yeah, well, I remember that storm very, very well. And the issue was where the line of the heavy snow was going to be and actually exactly it wasn't a terrible weather forecast they made a pretty good weather forecast yeah they ended up apologizing for their bad weather forecast and i actually wrote a blog saying no that was a good weather forecast you guys made where the problem was was that people you know had this deterministic and the mayor went on television saying we're closing down because there's two feet of snow forecast and and they didn't explain that Based on everything we know, we have to be ready for that. So let's react to being ready for that as opposed to reacting to the absolute forecast. I remember Well, that. I guess it's a well. question of what you mean by, I mean, I totally agree with you that if you look at the big picture and all the information that, the, that was put out, it was a good forecast, but it was communicated deterministically, yes. whereas that wasn't the right way to read it. And I think it was just a question of, you know, that, that was not an individual forecaster making a bad call. That's a weather service policy decision not to hit people with that level of probability, not to tell them all the full range of what the forecasters know to be possible. And so you end up with those kind of situations. And it's, and it, I mean, the other thing is that, that I think is needs, you know, that you just said it a couple minutes ago, but we need to make clear to people is that, you know, uh, crying wolf, you know, over forecasting, you know, I think forecasters in all over around the world, not just in the US are really afraid of this. They don't want to they don't want to say like there's a small chance of something terrible happening when there isn't or vice versa. They're really afraid of being wrong in a big way. But but because the actual information is probabilistic, I mean, it's not like the forecasters misrepresenting it and they're not telling you like right. the real story. Exactly. It really is like that. That means if you if you make a deterministic forecast, which seems to be what you know, is the standard practice around the world, this is going to happen. In other words, if people are doing the most responsible thing they can do, you know, at least as we understand it today, then they're going to be wrong some part of the time. And so and it's it, it's a guaranteed. It doesn't mean the forecasters did anything wrong. It means they're doing it right. And But it's so hard for people to get their head around that because they, mm -hmm. they feel like they were told something and it didn't happen. So it's I think that's the challenge. And to me, I think the way to deal with it is to give the user a little more credit mm -hmm. and tell them the probabilities or if even not the probability, the full range of possibilities, you know, a little more. Yeah. So I, I, I wrote about this issue because, you know, obviously I've been in the public communications arena for a long time and there has been a shift at the um, National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center, which I think is, is for the good that they have objectified this idea of uh, making forecasts for this reasonable worst case. The problem yeah. is that on an average day, you make forecasts for what is most likely to happen. You know, yeah. most likely the, the high temperature is going to be 85 degrees. Now, it's not that, you know, everybody that makes that forecast realizes, yeah, it could be 90, but we're not going to forecast 90 because that would be kind of misleading. We're going to forecast what we think is most likely. But when mm. an extreme event is coming, yeah. Now they use this this 10 percent exceedance threshold thing. And, and so it's it's this reasonable worst case, not the absolute worst case, but the reasonable worst case. But they also call that a forecast. Right. So yeah. so it gets yeah. murky because in the same in the same products, you can actually have both kinds of forecasts, which uh, it, I, I just think that 
intrinsically clouds the communications process. Not that I'm faulting them for going to a reasonable worst case, but we need to resolve this plan A, plan B way of making a, a forecast and make that clear so that people kind of get, get their minds around, okay, we're in plan B kind of forecast now because it's a potential extreme event. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you're right. It's a different kind of logic that kicks in in these big events and somehow we have to get across that that's the case. I mean, that okay, the usual way you think about the forecast isn't the right way to think about it because this is an extreme situation. Right. I mean, the other thing that's interesting that's changed, of course, is I'm sure you know better than anybody, is that although the Hurricane Center themselves doesn't show it, the public now has a lot of ways to see the guidance itself. I mean, they right. can see spaghetti plots from all the models and all this kind of stuff, and they have this vague sense that there's the European and the whatever. And, I mean, you know, I think in some ways it would be good if to show that, you know, if the Hurricane Center would just show it, because, you know, that's what they're drawing on to do it. And, like, the, the cone of uncertainty, of course, is not dynamic. It's it's based on historical errors. So some storms, the the the, tr the range of possibilities might be much narrower. In some other cases, it might be much wider. And the models sort of tell you that, but they don't want to show that. And I once talked to somebody there, and they said, yeah, we just don't think people understand it. And we know people are going to see it somewhere else. We just don't want it to come from us because, you know, we've got a... And it's a tricky thing, but it's like there's so much information out there. And, um, you know, it can be misinterpreted, but... Well, I, I, that's an interesting thing you bring up. So what I do is, is I quite often, uh, I did it today, as a matter of fact, put the spaghetti plots on top of the cone. And oh, yeah. then sometimes they spread all over the place and go way off the cone. And I say, okay, that implies the fact that the cone may not uh, be the right width for this storm. And sometimes they're in the center. But the thing about these spaghetti plots is if you sell the idea that if they're all kind of go in the same direction, that you have confidence in the forecast, right? I mean, that's a reasonable presumption. It's not always right, but it, it wasn't yeah. right with Dorian when it was down in the Caribbean, for example, but it's usually right. Usually if all the models kind of head in basically the same direction, it, it works. But it doesn't mean that two days, three days, four days in advance, there still isn't the error in the models and having all those spaghetti plots all on top of one another kind of implies that yeah. there isn't error. You know, the, the error still exists and that's why the cone gets wider as you go. So spaghetti plots, uh, if they don't, if they spread out nicely <laughs> in some kind of nice fan, then they tell a good story. When they all kind of lay on top of one another, uh, they don't tell as good a story because they don't tell you anything about the intrinsic error in the model uh, when you get into the future. Right. But what they are good for is that, you know, when half of them go right and half of them go left, like in Sandy or I think it was, was it Joaquin? Was Joaquin, yes, like exactly. You know, then then you know that, OK, the cone is not capturing. Right. You know, there's no way for a cone to get that. And right. so that's like useful information. I mean, the other sort of point that this is bringing up is that like whether it be, you know, you making the forecast on TV or or, um, you know, the Hurricane Center issuing their official products or even like me. I mean, I'm not a forecaster, but I occasionally like write things in the, the newspaper or whatever. Like all this information is being sent out in an ecosystem where people have 18 other sources of information, including social media, which gets everybody confused. So it's like somehow, you know, when the Hurricane Center says, we don't want to put out the spaghetti plots because we know people are seeing it, that's interesting. It's like they're not the sole source of information. They know that, and they're trying to calibrate what they're doing, you know, in a way that they're like the rock, you know, they're the, they're giving the, the hard core of the story and then everybody else is going to embellish it. And if that weren't happening, maybe they'd do things differently, but they know that it is happening. So it's like, you know, it's this three-dimensional chess thing of, of if you really try to think of what, you know, how people are thinking and what they're basing it on. Yeah, exactly. I don't uh, envy them trying to figure out where their their place is, but I like them as the rock. Uh, you know, oh, I yeah. wish they actually had a, a higher profile voice in the overall communication system. I wish the National Weather Service uh, did. I've, I've, I've made that point a number of times that, I wish the National Weather Service had a higher profile in this country in terms of a voice because we don't have societal rocks so much anymore like we did back in the day in the Walter Cronkite days. And even at a local level, you had 
weathercasters or anchor people or whatever that you just intrinsically believe. Now nobody believes anybody. So, yeah. you know, and there, there's looking for alternative opinions for everything. So the, the more the National Weather Service can be that voice uh, related to extreme weather, I, I just think we're better off as a country and a society. I think I agree with that, but I do think that a lot of people who are not, you know, in the Hurricane Center or the Weather Service who do some amount of forecast communication, whether it be full-time professionals like you or people like me who do a little bit once in a while, I mean, there there are a lot of responsible people who do make what the Hurricane Center says the basis of what they're doing. I mean, I oh, absolutely, I hundred percent. That's what I try and do. I try and make people exp- understand what yeah. it is that their their message is because sometimes it's just disguised in in uh, technical speak or it's just right. kind of disguised under multiple layers uh, in, in the products and the way it's distributed. I agree. Right. They, they leave a job for everybody else. And I mean, yeah. I sometimes get asked to comment on things and I, I feel like sometimes people are asking me to make a forecast. I look, I'm not going to make a forecast. You, this is where the forecast comes from. All I can do is like translate some of the words, you know, right. and tell a little bit of story about why they're saying that or you know, what else they could have said added on that they didn't, but that would have still been consistent with that. Yeah, yeah to me, that's that's uh, my role as a communicator is to try and help people understand what the National Hurricane Center forecast means and means to them. That, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, looking at the weather pattern that's going on out there right now and related to even Isa Isis, the storm coming up the East Coast, there's an unusually strong dip in the jet stream and a trough in, in meteorologists speak uh, that's yeah. pushing East East to the north. Does that remind you at all of Sandy, even though the orientation oh, is yeah. obviously very different, but having this very strong, deep uh, trough, uh, you know, here in, and at least with Sandy, we're talking about late October and here it's um, August. <laughs> I mean, it's a very Early unusually uh, deep situation. Uh, unusual yeah. situation. I mean, it reminds me not just of Sandy, but of pretty much every hurricane that hits the Northeast with any True. strength. I mean, they because yeah. they, they they can't get almost can't get here without that or without the high mm-hmm. offshore or both of them because mm-hmm. otherwise the westerlies blow them out to sea. So for us to get a significant storm, you almost need that. But the other thing about that that has happened, which was kind of interesting, I don't know if you were, I took I had to read the. The, the sort of history of the forecast a few times, you know, starting from last week to today to sort of grasp it and why the forecast for New York was tricky and why it changed in the last, I don't know, 24, 36 hours was that, you know, before they were saying, well, you know, it's going to go up into higher shear, so it's going to weaken. Right. But if you look just as of this morning, they say, well, with that big trough and the strong jet, it's going to get baroclinicity and it's going to strengthen because of that. And that's the interesting thing is once mm-hmm. you start to get the extra tropical dynamics, the shear can actually strengthen it, and the phasing of this one is right to do that. So I think that trough, I mean, it's too bad that we don't have maps to point at, but, <laughs> yeah, but that yeah. trough both sort right. of pulls it north and, and shoots it from, you know, from south to north instead of going west to east, so it, it makes it hit us here in the northeast. But it also, with if the phasing is right, it gives you an extra jolt of intensity. So, you know, we may get whatever, 50, 55 knot winds with gusts up to mm-hmm. 70 or something instead of 10, 15 knots less than that as a consequence of that. And that and that was a late development in the forecast. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's actually yeah. forecasting the jet streak, right? It's forecasting the band of strong winds coming around that dip in the jet stream because that uh, interaction with the, the storm does yeah. this so-called baroclinic, baroclinic enhancement of the intensity of the storm kind of becomes a little bit hybrid-y, but still tropical enough to call it tropical right exactly yeah, yeah they didn't they, they're not forecasting an extra tropical transition until i don't know i think i don't think it's in the cone at all yet but yeah it, canada i think uh, yeah maybe. essentially exactly so uh, which talking about hybrid storms uh, let's talk about sandy in your book called oh, yeah. uh, storm right. surge hurricane sandy our changing climate and extreme weather of the past and future that uh, you wrote in, in in 2014. So if I remember right, you lived through Sandy, right? You and your family yep. were in New York City? Yeah. Yeah. It was it kind of changed my life. Yeah. Um, I assumed it was it was as a result of the, that like extreme experience of being in the middle of that, that you felt like the story just had to be told. 
Was that what you're thinking? Mark? Sort of. I mean, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it wasn't a big event for me personally, the storm itself. I mean, I live up on a hill. Um, you know, I was in no danger of flooding. The winds here weren't that high. Um, I did go out for a walk kind of at the, you know, at the night around the time of landfall, but I knew it wasn't even that stormy. I mean, I knew if anything was going to kill me, it was going to be a tree branch falling on my head. So I was watching out for that. But, and our power didn't go out. I was in the part of Manhattan where that was, I was a few miles away from where that happened. What happened was it wasn't so much the storm itself. It was the fact that before the storm hit, I got a call or two um, to do an interview. I first, I got one to do an interview on TV, like the, a few, like five days, maybe more than five days before landfall, before we, it was really obvious that it was really going to be a thing mm-hmm. here. And then I just kept getting calls. And I was not somebody who had done a lot of media before that. And I ended up doing a huge amount. You know, it made landfall on a, on a Monday night. And all through that weekend, I was on the radio with Brian Lehrer. And all of a sudden, I was like, had this media, you know, um, uh, experience. And I'd never had that before. A frenzy, yes, I remember it yeah, well. Yeah, and I suddenly felt like, gee, people, you know, people are interested in what I have to say all mm-hmm. of a sudden. And um, at the same time, you know, I've been studying hurricanes for years and, you know, what, you know, thinking about what they do, but thinking of it as a faraway thing. And here it is happening in my own hometown. And, you know, I knew, I mean, it was known exactly what could happen in New York City. I had been to meetings of the American Society of Civil Engineers where they talked about after Katrina about building storm surge barriers across New York Harbor. I mean, it was known that someday this was going to happen. But I thought, you know, it might be in 200 years. I mean, with the, you know, I wasn't. <laughs> like prepared for it to be next week. And so, you know, I had always wanted to write a book about something. Um, and I had tried a couple times and I didn't quite have the right idea and I couldn't quite get it going. I couldn't convince any, you know, anybody to be interested in publishing it. And then after about two weeks of this, cause it kept going and it just snowballed. I mean, after the storm, I was doing all these interviews and, and giving all these talks. And it was just suddenly I, I was living a different life than I had before for a couple of months. And after a couple of weeks of that, I thought, okay, I guess this universe is telling me this is what I should write a book about because, you know, apparently there's people want to know more about this. You know, I, I didn't, I the first thought was like, oh, it's cheesy to write a book about a disaster that just happened. That's like, as a scientist, that seemed to me to be kind of lowbrow. But then I thought, but, but people keep asking me, you know, questions about it that are answerable, at least some of them are. So, yeah, that's that's what happened. Yeah. And it's not well understood. It just was not well understood while it was happening. It wasn't it's still to a significant degree. I don't think well understood. You're right. I mean, I was at I don't know how many seminars at uh, meteorology conferences over the years talking about the vulnerability of the subways and the tunnels and what they would do if Lincoln Tunnel flooded, I remember. And and certainly city officials knew that. But oh, yeah. listening to Mayor Bloomberg while that was happening, they seemed to get wound around the axle of, well, it's not a hurricane, really. So the right. storm surge won't be so bad. I mean, were you like right. screaming at the TV? Yes, I think we all <laughs> you know? were. I mean, about about the subways and all that. I mean, you know, there was a report written at least as early as 1995. Yes. That spelled out exactly what would happen. Yes. What would happen. I mean, they drew, they took photos of like, South Ferry subway station and other key things and drew lines like the water could go up to here and it would flood everything. This was, and then several more were done. Some of them were done by my colleagues here at Columbia, you know, uh, you know, in the following decades. Mm -hmm. So that was all known. Um, And I think, but to give credit, I think the fact that that was known did make a difference. I mean, you're right that in the short term they got mixed up because of that, of the extra tropical thing. There was about a 24 hour period where Bloomberg's people, even though they had apparently, I'm told they had a NOAA forecaster embedded in the agency, and Bloomberg was like the most savvy, you know. Yes, and, and a robust time. emergency management system and really right. smart people and, you know. Right, because of yes. 9-11 and all that. They, right. But somehow they got mixed up by that. And, um, and you know, there was now NOAA has changed the practice that they will issue keep the hurricane warnings up for something that's undergoing a tropical transition. So it wouldn't happen today. But at that time, they got mixed up by that. They caught up about a day later and they did the right things. But to give credit, I think, you know, so I, I wrote about this a lot. Like, I, it's true that that the hybrid nature and the tricky aspect of the forecast and how that messed up the, you know, it hadn't been accounted for in the forecast practices at the time so that hurricane warnings were not issued for the city, even though the forecast was incredibly accurate yes the forecast was incredible top. it was perfect they, <laughs> yes. they just did put yeah. hurricane at the top and that mixed right. up bloomberg so it's easy to focus on that but i think the fact that 
it had been studied, the problem had been studied for 20 years, did make a difference because those studies had come up with recommendations of what to do. They had mm -hmm. said, you know, if this happens, shut down the subways uh, a day at least or a couple days ahead of time, get people out of the way, do evacuations, and they had the surge zones. In other words, all the steps to take had been outlined so that in the and and Bloomberg and his people knew that so that when it happened, they didn't have to figure all that out. And they did the right things. They did them a little late and they did a few things wrong. Not evacuating nursing homes was a problem because they didn't realize that the power was going to go out after. And, well, you know, and the people, they had 37 nursing homes right in the storm surge zone. It was, yeah, you know, that was the worst problem. Horrible. And of course, the other problem was that those reports also said we should invest in, um, you know, uh, better protection for all these facilities that are going to flood, you know, build, build better walls, you know, elevate mm -hmm. stuff, all, all that, that would have required long-term investment didn't happen because it was seen as something that would happen someday. And it's this problem of the same problem as we have with climate change that for every politician, you know, it's, it's way outside the horizon of their term. So it's sort of like hard to invest money in it historically, although maybe that'll be changing now. I don't know, but all that's true, but I think the science did have an impact. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you saw a pretty good emergency response here, all things considered, because it had been researched ahead of time compared to places where if that hadn't happened, it would have been worse. Well, and, and in New York, you know, once bad things happen, you have all this brute force of money and people and expertise and, you know, and, and all that, that you can actually handle these things that you couldn't handle in other places. I actually work with the New York Times and trying to figure out what in the hell went wrong with these ultra smart people and a really dedicated set of, of you know, a structural government there to really try to do the right thing. And it, it came down to really two big things. One was that the uh, National Weather Service forecasters that briefed them put at the end of their briefings every day, this is starting on the Thursday, so it happened Monday night, right? Uh, came ashore Monday night, starting on Thursday, and maybe it was even Wednesday, they, at the end of the briefing, they made an equivalency to Irene. Oh, yeah. And and in Irene, the <laughs> storm surge forecast was four to eight feet. Yeah. In Sandy, the storm surge forecast was four to eight feet. Well, it yeah. came in at four feet, four and a quarter feet in Irene, and somehow it didn't, you know, that next step of, gee, could this one be eight feet instead of, because they made that equivalency. So that was a big problem. So in fact, but it, it was nine in the end. In nine, it was nine <laughs> in the end, exactly. And, and then the other problem was that because Irene came in as a tropical storm, they didn't get reimbursed for all the evacuations because of the stupid FEMA policies that if it comes in as a hurricane, you get reimbursed, but they didn't oh. get reimbursed. So, so the people that had to make these decisions on Friday is when they had to make the decisions with the nursing homes. That was what they said. They said they still hadn't gotten reimbursed and they, they couldn't make themselves pull the trigger for something that seemed like it was going to be like Irene, had the same forecast as Irene, wasn't going to be a hurricane. You know, all these things kind of uh, converged and, and led to uh, decisions. that They were all well-intentioned decisions. Nobody was being lazy about it. They were fretting over this, I'm sure. Uh, but anyway, so... Um, that was what we learned in in sort of sorting through um, the records. Well, I think, you know, you raised two important points. Just I know uh, there's other things to talk about, but a couple of things are worth saying. I mean, first is we said the forecast was excellent. I mean, that's one way in which it wasn't quite excellent is that the forecast of four to eight feet of surge. And then it was actually outside that range. Yes. So. Yeah. That was actually a but but eight feet of surge would have been a would have been a lot of bad surge. Well, it was nine feet <laughs> yeah. of surge, yeah. and it and it hit exactly at high tide. Right. So you know I, that yeah. was just a really extreme scenario, and you know that's why the power went out. I mean the those substations that blew out. You know I think they had walls that were twelve feet around them, and nobody had imagined it could be fourteen above low tide, which is what it was. <laughs> yeah. But but the other thing, I mean, Irene the year before was an incredible stroke of bad luck, not just in terms of the decisions of. The government and the emergency managers but also individual people i mean quite a few people died because of that because they mm -hmm. had been through that and as you say the forecast was about the same it was about right. as bad as sandy nothing happened pretty much in the city which was incredibly lucky and 
the forecasters didn't do anything wrong there. I mean, as we just said, they made a reasonable forecast given the, you know, they communicated the reasonable worst case scenario and then it didn't materialize and that's going to happen. But people, you know, then when they get the exact same forecast only a year later, which is very short, I mean, think of that, right. two storms like exactly. that two years in a row in New York City is like almost inconceivable historically. Right. So then, you know, a lot of people didn't evacuate who should have. And, you know, afterwards, I mean, I've been at, you know, been at events with people from, you know, on Long Island and elsewhere, they say, oh, my God, because of Irene, I didn't evacuate. It's the stupidest decision of my life. I nearly died and, you know, whatever. But that's what happened. Yeah, there's no question about it. That, that I mean, the whole thing taken together was a freak event, besides Sandy being a freak event all by itself. So meteorologically, we've had hybrid storms before, right? This kind of mix between a nor'easter and a, oh, trop yeah. a tropical storm or hurricane. I mean, the most famous one is the perfect storm in 1991 that— a northern yeah. storm absorbs Hurricane Grace or what was left of Hurricane Grace. And then a hurricane kind of forms in the middle. And in that case, they didn't go back and name it a hurricane again because they thought everybody would get just freaked out. Uh, but that was a different yeah. time, 1991. So but meteorologically, I mean, how unusual is it? Is it that in modern time now we just, you know, can see all this in minute detail compared to, to the kind of more broad brushy way that we understood storms you know back when we didn't have instrumentation and high definition satellites and all that or or is it really an unusual or freaky meteorological event for that to happen i don't think it's that freaky um and i think that if you look at tropical cyclones hitting the northeast u.s historically all of them pretty much are in some degree of extratropical transition they may not have completed it yet. I mean, they might still be tropical. But like 1938, all famously the 1938 38, storm. You know, yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're all, you know, again, to make that south to north track and hit mm -hmm. here without recurving, they have to be sandwiched between a, a, a trough to the west and a high to the east. And if the phasing is right, they're going to, you know, they, they're undergoing ET. Whether they strengthen because of that is another question. Right. I mean, Sandy did, um, Isaias looks like is going to a little bit, but, you know, they can also weaken. But that transition, I mean, the sea surface temperature is low up here. The jet stream is up here. You know, it's going it, it, to, they, they're going to go through. They almost can't. It's hard for them to get here and stay 100% purely tropical. It's just a, ju a judgment call or a, you know, a gray area of when they've actually made the transition. And I'm glad you asked this question because, um, you know, Sandy, one of the things it did is I had not re done research on extratropical transition before that. But as you can imagine, I got interested in the topic. <laughs> I can imagine. And we had a PhD student who just finished, Melanie Bielli, who did a thesis on it. And, um, she uh, did a bunch of different things, but a, her, she wasn't really studying climate change, but along the way she looked at trends to see if there were any. We couldn't see any. In other words, as best as we can tell, doing it as objectively as possible, the, the fraction of storms undergoing extratropical transition doesn't really seem to have changed over time. Um, and, there, and by the way, the models don't seem to be predicting that it will change over time, although other things may change about the tracks and stuff um, with climate change. So as best as we can tell, I don't think it's freaky and it's a, i mean it's a especially in the atlantic it's a pretty large fraction of storms that do it i can't remember 40 or 50 percent or something that do it eventually mm -hmm. and the west and north pacific also the rest of the world not so much interestingly Interesting. i mean some of them are in the southern hemisphere but the eastern pacific it's kind of hard for them to do it the indian ocean they basically can't do it because they hit land, land first mm -hmm. the, the yeah it's so fine. small yeah yeah so the the North Atlantic has more um, of these hybrids than the rest of the world, but here there, it's no, it's not a freaky thing, and and I yeah, for us I think it's kind of a it's part of the course. So we may not notice it, but that's what you know. And it's and a situation where the thing is a lot of them weaken. So a situation where it undergoes ET, and it hits land, and it's strong, like that's what was weird with Sandy, you know. And it hits a major metro area. <laughs> yeah, all well. Things. The most major metro area. Well, and there was another freaky thing with Sandy, which I think correlates it back to the, the, the perfect storm. And that was that it wasn't as much a hybrid or a subtle transition like this this um, Isaias thing where, yes, you get a little baroclinic, for, uh, baroclinic forcing that just makes it go spin a little faster. But it actually structurally looked like there was a real tropical system embedded in a larger non-tropical envelope. Do you know what I mean? In in yeah. the case of Sandy and the satellite pictures I've seen of the uh, the perfect storm uh, seemed like that was the 
So that seems like a, a, a different model of uh, hybrid storm than the the kind that we normally think of that kind of make a, a transition, direct transition from tropical to extra tropical or, you know, from tropical into a nor'easter kind of storm. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about it that was a problem was that you know the fact that the the sort of outer circulation i mean you're right there was still a little core in there but there i'm not talking about what it hit when it hit it, it you know that was a different thing but i mean i'm talking about uh maybe the day before it hit or a day and a half before it hit when it was still you know well, there's still gulf stream influence but it was getting big you know it well, was but the, even down in the bahamas it already got big yes yeah, I mean, true. That's first, true that was the beginning of the et event it you're had right. one drop you're there right. It got really big and it stayed big. And then it got another jolt up here when it did the final merger with that other system. And so even though, you know, the peak winds weren't that high, you know, it was barely, barely. hurricane intensity yes. at that time. Mm -hmm. But the circulation was so huge and the angle, I mean, that was the really yes. unusual thing was the angle it came in, you know, um, was what made the storm surge so bad. And that was, you know, I mean, the, again, the forecasters pretty much knew that, although the surge forecast was a little low, but... You know, it's just, it was sort of like, I mean, there hadn't been a surge event like that in New York City in at least 200 years. I mean, 1821 was the last one. And that was a very I, different kind of thing. That was a straight up, the you know, straight up Broadway kind of a right. a, a storm, right? Right. Uh, that, that's my understanding. And, you know, the data isn't as good. I don't know, right. you know, but the right. city wasn't, you know, had many, many fewer people, etc. It wasn't, it's actually, it's interesting. It's hard to find anything in history books about that. I've tried, but it was like, it was probably about as bad as Sandy, but because there was, you know, the city had 100,000 people instead of 8 million and there was no subways, no power, not as much stuff to break. Right. It's like it barely registered. I've got a book, you know, like a foot thick. That's a history of New York City and there's nothing on it in there. So, you know, but the mm -hmm. point is, like meteorologically, it was, you know, the models predicted it. The forecasters understood it. It was fine. But mm -hmm. in terms of people's experience in New York City, because we're in this corner yeah, I mean, Long right. Island, like, and Southern New England, different story, right? The 30, they have 38 and a whole bunch of other storms. But here, we're in such a corner that we it's kind of hard to get in here and do a lot of damage for a hurricane. So that was just a, you know, it was just hard for people to grasp it. When I mean, I remember, you know, knowing kind of a, a few days before the subways were probably going to flood and being on social media or something with some friend who said what's like so it'll be like a day and we'll be back to work and i was like no you don't get it <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is going to shut the place down for a while the first right thing happened. but but there was no the only way you could know that was by understanding the science there was no historical analog right right understanding the science but but like you say people it's not like nobody had thought this out i mean this had been indeed uh, thought out. So before we, we leave Sandy and your book, this is a, a, the smallest possible thing, but it just drives me a little bit crazy. I, <laughs> I noticed that the wind speeds that you talked about in the book, uh, that you talked about in knots, but distance in uh -oh. miles and storm surge in feet. And uh -huh. the Hurricane Center uses miles per hour in their public advisories, but they use knots everywhere else. And uh, it's sort of, as a communications guy, the, you know, this just drives me kind of crazy. So why exactly do we need knots in the world? I mean, if we just stuck with miles per hour and kilometers per hour, I mean, I understand, you know, metric people, and I, I get that, and it would be wonderful if we were all kilometers per hour people or meters per second people or something. But, and I know a mile is like a super unscientifically derived unit of measure, uh, not that a knot you know, a knot going off the back of a boat doesn't seem very scientific to me either. But, but, uh, but at least it relates to the size of the Earth, uh, sort of. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, what's what's your thought as an academic about this whole issue of, you know, uh, how we communicate things and and how sort of, you know, units come into play in this. Obviously, oh it's, a, it's an American problem uh, more than it is a, a world problem, but it is our problem. Yeah, you're right. I mean, um, I mean, in the book, I use knots because the Hurricane Center uses knots. And well, they do use miles per hour, but the but the thresholds for what's a hurricane and not and so forth are really in knots. Yes. And as you know, a lot of the scientific data is actually in knots. Yes. Yeah, so, but bizarrely, 
I mean, except where it's in meters per second, you know, I mean, and well, but the increments yeah. of, of intensity are five knots. I mean, they translate right. it, but like right. the, that's the that's the unit of measurement, actually. Yeah, so it came so, from from the Beaufort scale. I mean, you talk about, yeah. you know, archaic uh, <laughs> sort of yeah, way of thinking about wind speeds, but going back to 1811 right. or something, I mean, you know. It's kind of. I mean, you're right, crazy. but if you if you start thinking about this, the only logical place to get to is that everything should be metric, as you said, and yeah. it's it's like there's no you know any compromise doesn't make so either you give into it or you. I mean, for me, you know, the convenient thing about knots is that whatever it is in knots, it's a little more than that in miles per hour. That and it's half that in meters per second. Right. right? Exactly. So, yes. So I. I that that's how I think. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I have rules like that for Celsius to Fahrenheit too. I mean, I don't know. You're right. I, I you know, as an academic, I have no answer except everything you say is true. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. dumb that we have these um, that we have these all these different units, and we should, you know, in, in the United States, we should get over it. But there's a lot of things we do different than the rest of the world that I wish we didn't. So exactly, yeah. and yeah, and it's because we often because we did it first, and we stick with what we did before people came up with a better idea. Uh, so all right, let, let's go go back to the beginning because I I, I love your podcast and the the mm, idea of you. the podcast of becoming a scientist. Did you get interested in weather and climate because there was some kind of big weather event when you were a kid, like most meteorologists I know, or were you more interested in science and you evolved toward weather and climate, or how'd that happen? The second one, I was not, uh, and I, and the story is in the, my book actually, though it's very brief because I'm trying not to write about myself, but um, I was not a weather weenie as a kid. There was not uh, a weather event that burned itself into my brain. I didn't really have a particular interest in it um, other than that I sort of enjoyed, you know, looking out at thunderstorms when they happened. But other than that, I didn't have a particular obsession with it until what happened was I studied physics in college, um, physics and music, actually, it's a double major. I actually wanted to be a musician for a while, but I was into science from very, very young from, as a very, very small child, but not meteorology particularly. I was into, you know, astronomy and physics and dinosaurs and whatever at different ages. And then... Um, yeah, so in college I was a physics major and music major. I tried to be a musician for a couple of years, didn't work out. And then I was, uh, I moved to California when I was about in my early 20s, uh, following my girlfriend at the time. We're married now since 30, you know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. But um, I was living in California. I was sort of unemployed. I had been working as a, actually as a sound engineer in New York City before that, but then I, I couldn't get another job. It was the early 90s, and it was kind of a recession in California, and I, mm -hmm. I had some crummy temp jobs, and I was like, and I decided to go back to grad school. I said, this musician thing's not going to happen for me, and after a while, I decided to study science, and I thought, you know, as a physics major, I thought I'd study physics, but I had been out in the world a couple of years, a few years at that point, and I knew that the job market I had some understanding of what the job market is, you know, that you can have crummy jobs or no job, and that you know, I knew I should think about that. It wasn't just like I was just continuing with my studies. I was thinking about it as a professional thing. And I thought, well, I better choose my area of physics carefully because they're very different. Like you can study, you know, theoretical cosmology or something, and then you're going to be an academic. But there's other areas like solid state physics where you could go and design circuit boards or you could, you know, you could work in industry. And right. I, I knew that it would be a very different experience, even in the same department, depending on what I did. So I started thinking about that. And I was talking to my then girlfriend about it. And she was an environmental scientist. She was doing a master's at UC Berkeley in, um, in the forestry school and like resource management, studying stream restoration stuff, which she still does, still works on. But anyway, so she was an environmental scientist, and she was concerned about global warming already in high school in the 80s, which not too many hmm. people were. That's true. She was, such a, she was such an environmentalist that, that she was. And, and she said, if I, so this is about 1992, 90, 91, 92, and she said, if I had your background at it. if I had studied physics I would do meteorology and study global warming and I said ah it kind of seems kind of boring I mean I believed in global warming even at the time but it just seemed like okay the planet's warm because we have co2 so you add more co2 it gets warmer like where's how is that an exciting scientific like mm -hmm. coming from physics where you have these all these kind of brain twisting things like relativity and quantum mechanics it just didn't seem sexy to me but I started researching it and she actually had an uncle who worked for the FAA in Monterey, and he knew a lot of meteorologists um, at the Naval Postgraduate School and the Naval Research Lab. And so I was, I was living near there, so I went down there and talked to them, and I did some reading, and I, and I started to really get interested in it. And I liked that it was computer simulation, 
because uh, I, I had worked in labs, physics labs by that point, and I didn't like that like the equipment sometimes broke and I didn't know how to fix it. <laughs> your experiment wouldn't work. So I liked computer simulation. It seemed like imaginary worlds, virtual world. I was kind of, and I loved fluid mechanics. I liked to watch, you know, rivers and stuff like that. And, and I guess I, com computers like, were just coming along where you could actually do computer simulations that would have maybe some meaning uh, by that time, it weren't was they? Early '90s, so they've been around Very, a while. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, you know, the, the numerical weather prediction started in the '50s, right? So it True. was already yeah. wasn't like it is today, but it was getting there, and there was. And, but also, I mean, I wasn't really political about it at that time. I've become more so since then, but. The fact I like the fact that it was relevant to human life and human society in some sort of general way that you're not just like making widgets with it, right. that you're doing something that's valuable broadly to people. And honestly, at that time, it was not just global warming, but the ozone hole was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, these problems are not going to go away. And there's job security in that. That's a cynical thought that actually went through my head. And also, the last fact is that it was um, because my physics grades hadn't been that good as an undergrad. Uh, atmospheric science was a little bit less competitive. So I got into MIT as a graduate student, whereas I never would have in physics. So that was actually part of it, too. So anyway, that's my story. Oh, fascinating. Well, so, so which gets me to the question about becoming a scientist. Is it different now for young people, the ones that you encounter that come to Columbia, and, and do they come in and say, I want to be a scientist? Or is the, is the process, you know, has it evolved over the years to something different? Right. That's a great question. And I'm happy. I mean, first of all, thank you for letting me plug the podcast. It's called Deep Convection. And we I talked to other climate scientists about a lot of things, but not just science, but especially how they got into it. And and I, I quite and I ask almost everybody this question of not just how they got into it, but because global warming has so kind of taken over our our consciousness in this field. And I think rightly so. Uh, I asked people, you know, did you get into this field with some amount of social consciousness? You know, did you think that you were going to solve the world's problems or were you just a science nerd and you just ended up in it? And most people say number two. Most people have said to me, now these are people of generally of my age or older, but in my experience, it's true even of my recent graduate students who are like they might be in their early 30s, you know, by the time mm -hmm. they finish or late, 20, late 20s, that they didn't get into it to save the world. You know, they got into it because they were just science nerds or maybe they were weather weenies, whatever. But the fact that they ended up in this particular field is um, is an accident or, uh, you know, whatever their act, whatever mm -hmm. it might have been in their case. There's a small number of exceptions to that, but that's the case. However, I do think it is changing just now with this youngest generation. I think there are kids coming into the field now who are coming, a much higher proportion of them are coming into because the climate problem really concerns them and they want to be engaged with it somehow. And an interesting question, that's the next question you might ask is like, are you, at, if you believe that climate change is a huge problem for the world, and I absolutely am 100% convinced of that, such that I'm bringing it up when you didn't even ask me. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you. <laughs> you. You know, another question is, is are you helping by becoming a scientist? Mm -hmm. I mean, is is it a science problem anymore? And I think to first order the answer is no. No, I mean, in other right. words, I agree that, with you. I mean, I, not entirely. I think when it comes to, so I'm actually writing an essay about this. So I'm just going to talk about it for a second. Um, I think for climate adaptation, that the science does matter. So climate adaptation mm -hmm. means you know helping people deal with the effects of it. And I would include any kind of forecast at, in the adaptation, you know, realm in the sense that you're. You're letting people make, you're not trying to change what's happening. You're trying to let people decide what to do about it. And I think for that, there is still a role for scientists, although the kind of science you have to do might be a little bit different than you, we might have done historically. But when it comes to mitigation, which is, you know, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to, you know, to make the world better, to reduce the extent to which global warming happens, we already know enough to do that. And the problem is political. So it's a... Not political and communicating it and, and getting it to filter down into people's psyche so that they it actually becomes a, a settled thought with them. But for the younger people, I agree with you that I don't know any young people that that don't accept the, the climate threat and, uh, the, you know, that that is a, just a fundamental aspect of the future that has to be dealt with. But do you encounter, uh, you know, uh, undergraduates, did you encounter kids when they first come into school in your role there at Columbia? Or, uh, you know, so um, I'm, one of my kids were in, in high school. I, I went and spoke to uh, 
uh, their class about meteorology and science and, and whatnot. And I remember half of the class was not at all interested in the fact I was there. And the other half, uh, split right down the middle, were <laughs> extremely interested. And I thought, boy, you know, at least that group over there, you know, they've, they're they already thinking about things at a different level than I was when I was in high school. And I'm just wondering if, if you have a sense that there are uh, kids coming out of high school now that have really thought out things that, that maybe we didn't think about until, until we were much older about uh, how their path in the future is going to go. Are you asking about how they feel about climate change? Or yeah, climate change. Are, well, are well and, about their career choices? Yeah, well, I mean, the idea that they've made career choices in high school, which, which I mean, not that I didn't have ideas in high school what I wanted to do, but I don't, I just don't feel like they were as focused as some high school students that I encounter and some young people I encounter, not all by any means, but I, I find, yeah. you know, that there's a, a group of, or some, you know, strata of people in high schools, even here in Miami-Dade County, which has some great public high schools that have just, you know, are having a kind of adult thoughts about how to solve oh. big world problems. Um, yeah. That more no, so I, than in the past, it seems to me. I, I think, you're right. I mean, I think there's a couple different things going on there. Um, and, you know, I don't have any statistics to back this up, but it is my impression from from teaching undergraduates that, um, first of all, I think overall, the ones I teach, I mean, you know, Columbia is a highfalutin university and it's hard to get in here. So, you know, they're very academically, uh, you know, um, you know, they have very, very, very strong academic records, whatever else other advantages they may have had, they've all worked hard to get here. And so, so take that as it as it may, but compared to um, similar groups of students 20 or 30 years ago, I think, first of all, they're more pre-professional. I think they're thinking more concretely about their careers, certainly than I did. Yeah. But I think a lot of my friends did. We were just kind of, you know, you went to college and you think big thoughts and take interesting classes. And at some point you get out and it's like, oh my God, I have to do something, you know, but I think it's maybe it's partly because college costs so much more in real dollars than it did. Although it was you know, expensive back then, but it's way more expensive now. Right. People have stress over that. Maybe it's partly the sort of sense that, you know, the, you know, our kids future won't be as good as ours was. And so everybody feels like their sort of place in the hierarchy is slipping and everybody's stressed out over that. You know, I don't know what it is, but I think they're, First of all, they're more pre-professional, and that's whether, true whether they're socially conscious or not. But there is also a large group that is socially conscious. I mean, look at this youth climate movement, right? It's an amazing thing. I mean, there was, there was politically active kids in my day, for sure. I knew plenty of them, and I, I was not one of the most politically active myself, but I was a little bit because of it, you know, it was around me, and I kind of got, you know, I was a little bit involved in South Africa, the divestment movement, and stuff like that. So there was political activism, but like the youth climate movement, is not just kids are politically active, they are leading it, right? It yep. has changed the whole debate. High school kids. That's well, and like we have 16 year old leading the world to some degree in, in right. the idea of climate awareness. I mean, it really is, it right. really is stunning. It's like, okay, the adults have screwed this up really badly. It's like the kids, uh, you know, have kind of decided to take over. It's an right. amazing thing to yeah. see. Yeah, I think it's true. Part of it might be social media. You know, I don't know what it is, but. But I think you're right. There is that. It's not all of them, but there is definitely a substantial group that is a little bit engaged in a different way than most of our generation, my generation was. And and they're um, some of them are making, you know, career decisions based on that. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in college, I mean, I um, you know, I'm older than you. And so I was there for Vietnam War protests and uh, the Gay Liberation Front and the every kind of liberation front that that you could have you know i mean there were real groups of people on campus and and there were troops on campus and there was you know it was all during that that period of time and so obviously those were young people those were all students that were uh uber uh, uh, politically engaged back then and then there was this you know kind of a i don't know complacency or uh, it 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 changed, right? When we got into the 70s and the 80s, and and now you you feel some of that energy that that existed back then in the late 60s and early 70s that, to some degree, was sparked by outrage over Vietnam. Uh, I think that that spilled over into other uh, 
arenas. But anyway, it, it, is, it, is, it is interesting. But, you know, the way that your career evolved and the way that I think most of the people that you talk to in your podcast evolved, where they started going in one direction and then they eventually came around to their direction where they made these accomplishments and they studied phenomena and they, you know, solved scientific problems and so forth. And, and they ended up concentrating in something different than where they started. I'm a little bit intrigued about whether uh, the kids that jump in and are with single mindedly going in a certain direction are missing, might be missing their best opportunity and, you know, their best selves uh, in the future by well, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I maybe. see advantage in in experiencing many different things, and uh, and then picking one as you get a little older and maybe have a little more, you know, maturity about you. Yeah, maybe. But but just because some of these kids have more confidence than we did about their direction when they're young doesn't mean they're not going to still go through that. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're going to keep in the yeah, direction they true. think they that's are. They may true. have yeah. the same process. I want to tell you one more story about about this. I mean, I think besides the other thing I've learned by talking to people is that I'm not alone in not just that, you know, my career has evolved in different, you know, ways. I mean, in the last 20 years, it hasn't really evolved. I've been doing the same thing. But but um, what has evolved is that I've become more politicized about the climate problem. I think that's true of a lot of my colleagues. And that reflects that the world has become more politicized about it. And we've started to feel like, what are we doing here? You know, the the, whatever we've been doing hasn't been working. We've been saying this for a long time, and, and we're all kind of realizing, you know, that that something has to change about this. And our role as scientists is kind of driving us to, you know, what how people respond to it in different ways. But but this is hap this is happening, and for the young people, they're coming into it politicized. And just to tell you one more story to demonstrate that. So now we have Black Lives Matter, and one of the things that's going to happen in my department. Um, is that we're going to have a seminar course, a graduate PhD level seminar course in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences next semester um, about uh, race and uh, climate justice. I forget the exact title of the course, but yeah. it's something like that. And that is happening because the students demanded, mm -hmm. graduate students said, we want to have a course on this. You know, can we do this? And they went to the department and the department got a couple of faculty to, to help put it together. I'm, I, I'm loosely involved in it. Um, and, you know, so that's the first time I've ever in my time as a professor that I've seen a course come into existence specifically because students said we want to have a course on this and we're having outside speakers come and talk about it. And it's a direct response to what's happening politically. And they're so they're leading it. So I think it's just another example where you're seeing that happen. Yeah. And um, it is this there is this element of, of people, a large number of people that are just, you know, have are essentially saying we've had enough. Of, of the old way, right? And it's, I guess, back to the same idea of we're taking over. Uh, and uh, But obviously, of the students that come, although you're at Columbia University, not at uh, Florida State, where I went to school, and no doubt there are different kinds of students that, that uh, go to these different schools. But my sense is that the part of the incoming students that is politically active now is just bigger than it was but but I wonder do you still at all in your you know dealing with undergraduate students do you deal with any young people that uh, are starting at zero on sort of their understanding of the climate threat and and the basic issues involved I don't know you know I um I mean I've taught for a few years um uh, our beginning undergraduate climate course. So it's it's um, it's like climate science for people that haven't had any before. It's not even really that much about global warming. It's sort of the fundamentals you need to understand to put global warming in context. And then we do it a little bit, but it's just how the climate system works. And there's no calculus in it. So it's it's taken by earth science majors, but it's also taken by you know English majors and stuff because it satisfies a basic science requirement. And so that's maybe a representative group. I also teach applied math. To undergraduates, so those yeah. are more, you know, tech, science, and you know, math. Uh, of course, in the first kids. class there, they're taking a climate class, yeah, so maybe they have some true. interest, uh, you know, intrinsic interest, fundamental right. interest. I, but I guess the basic answer is, you know, I only know if they come and talk to me in my office or something, or they come after class and mm -hmm. say something. Otherwise, I don't really know what their prior background is. But my guess is, no, that they're all aware of it, 
to some level. They may not have an incredibly sophisticated understanding, but that they know it's there and that they're, you know, have some level of belief and concern about it. Yeah, at Columbia, I, I would I would think so if they're going, if they're in that school. I can that, tell you one thing. I have never had anybody openly express any amount of denial in any of my class. Never. If, if they if they don't, you know, if they don't uh, accept the mainstream consensus on climate science, they're keeping very quiet about it. I've never had anybody express that to me. So do you still personally bump into people that deny that climate is changing? I'm not talking about in, in class, but in, you know, in New York, uh, or is it just fundamentally uh, understood now that climate is changing and humans are involved in that? Uh, what's your experience? Because I, I, when I go give a talk, I just talk as if, as if everybody in the room understands that this is a serious problem and we're down to talking about what to do about it, not whether the problem exists. That's right. I have the same experience. I, I almost never encounter that. Once or twice I have, um, when I've given public talks, I've had somebody, you know, sort of heckle me and give me a hard time, or I've had to argue with them once. It happened to me once in a scientific conference, not a small conference of physicists. Um, uh, in New York State, it happened once that I got in an argument with some people. So I've encountered it a very little bit, but I, again, in this, I, and we know, of course, that there's a large fraction of the of you know of the country that watches Fox News and 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 you know doesn't accept the mainstream consensus on on climate, but and doesn't um, get it is the problem. They, do, they doesn't don't. want to get it. Right. But 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 I don't encounter if I'm running into those people in my daily life or in my experience communicating with people about climate. They if I encounter them, they're they're keeping quiet. Yeah, that's, it's because they know they're in such a minority. That, <laughs> that's my experience it, too, though. I mean, in a you know but, a large you know, I'm group in New York of city, and you know I'm seeing yeah. people who are coming to a guy giving a talk about climate. So there, if there are people who are who are making an activity out of going and and heckling or something, then I'm not high enough profile to attract them. I guess is what it. Yeah, I know. Well, I normally go. Of course, I'm not speaking about climate. I'm. They know me as the hurricane guy, uh, but. Uh, if I'm talking to a local group here and they're interested in how are we going to deal with hurricanes, that that immediately segues into how we're we going to deal about deal with climate because they're so fundamentally related from a sea level rise standpoint and uh, you know you're protecting yourself from from uh, nature and the ocean and and so forth uh, is yeah. they're interrelated at, at the very least. You know the number one question I get because I'm a hurricane guy and people ask me hurricane questions uh is are there more hurricanes now or maybe it's phrased as of course there are more hurricanes now because of climate change right uh because mm -hmm. uh, you know we've had all these recent landfalls and big storms and and uh news coverage and so mm -hmm. forth uh but you know and i say well you know if you've been around here in the 40s there yeah. were, you know, five category four hurricanes in six years uh, right, right here. Right. And not to mention some right. other smaller storms. And if you'd been around in the 20s, you wouldn't have believed what happened in the late 20s right here. So and I usually you know, respond like that and and uh, and say that there there really isn't any evidence that the that you can put your finger on to say that hurricanes are changing because. Uh, but anyway, but I'm not the, the climate guy. You're the climate guy. So how do you answer a question like that? And and if you answer it, how do you segue into uh, something that you found gets people thinking in the right direction about climate and and, and what needs to be done? Yeah, I've spent so much time talking and writing about this. First of all, I think, you know, are hurricanes changing is a different question from are there more hurricanes? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of evidence that hurricanes are changing. It's not 100% um, uh, conclusive, um, mostly because there aren't that many hurricanes in the world. And so, you know, the data is inherently uh, not that much. You know, if you want to ask what's happening to temperature, you have a measurement of temperature everywhere in the world all the time. So there's a huge amount of data whereas there's very few hurricanes so the statistics are just naturally noisier and of course we but care think, about we care about atlantic hurricanes which is a 
sub super super subset of right. tropical systems all over the world too right i mean you're That's talking right. talking about a, a dozen or or maybe two dozen in an extreme year so uh, yeah so i think there's a couple different things going on one is i think there's a lot of evidence that hurricanes are producing more rain and also that on average the winds are strengthening and we're getting more high extremes now it whether that passes all the significance tests um is another question, but I think we look at these things in a very uh, conservative way. So if you go to the NOAA webpage, you can find statements that, you know, we haven't yet detected a change in hurricane, uh, whatever property of hurricanes it is, they may have changed, the, you know, they've had statements up that like there, like that up there. And what they mean is, if you look at the trends, you can't with 95% confidence rule out that the, the trend is zero, you know, that, that there's no global warming signal. Yeah, there's that nat the natural, it's a natural kind of fluctuation, uh, possibly. So well, natural yeah. fluctuation is another thing. We should come back to that in a second. But but you can't 100% rule out that there's no, you know, the, mm -hmm. the null hypothesis that there is no trend due to human activity. But you don't think like that about risk in any other way. Like if you were issuing a hurricane forecast, would you say, well, I can't rule out with 95% confidence that you won't get hit by a hurricane, so don't worry about it. We don't. You don't think like that. You give the range of possibilities and the evidence you have for each one and what your best guess is and our best guess and it's not just a guess there's a lot of inf you know, information behind it not just from observations but from what we understand physically about the physics of hurricanes as well as all the computer models we have is that they are getting stronger and producing stronger winds as well as definitely producing more uh, coastal flooding because as you said sea level is going up so I think all those things are are true and the way we frame it is is way too conservative and that's just a historical artifact. I mean, the reason people use 95% confidence against a null hypothesis of no change, that's not written in stone anywhere. That's not a law of science. That's a random historical artifact of how the discipline of statistics evolved. It doesn't make sense for this situation. So I, I think there's a lot of evidence that hurricanes are, are getting more dangerous now. But the flip side of it is that there is there really is no good evidence that the number of hurricanes is increasing. And, and we don't even think we don't even know if it should be increasing. In other words, with hurricanes producing more rain and being stronger, that's something we think should be happening, and the data are consistent with it, even though they're also consistent with other things because they're noisy, but but we have good reason to think that. We have no good, I mean, our, we don't know whether the number of hurricanes should go up or down. We used to think it should go up with warming. Then we thought all the models said it should go down. It should and go now down, right. It should go up again. We don't really know. And so when we can't detect the trend, it's like, well, maybe there is no trend or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, we just don't know. In the Atlantic, it's trickier because there are these long cycles. As you say, you know, the 50s and 60s were really active. The 70s and 80s were quiet and then it came back up again. And there probably would be natural cycles, but it's also the case that that low period in the 50s and 60s was very likely, at least in part, human caused, not by global warming, but by the fact that there was aerosol pollution blowing off the U.S., Sulfur dioxide that formed aerosol particles cooled the ocean by blocking the sun. Low sea, sea surface temperature was part of the reason for that low period. And then when the Clean Air Act cleaned all that stuff out, the ocean warmed back up again, and uh, we had a, you know we had an increase. And if you believe that's true, then the implication is that it's not may not go back down again the way it did before. So the Atlantic and, and that's the Atlantic in particular. That's not a global story. That's the Atlantic story. So I you know what looks like a natural cycle may not have been a natural cycle, and we may stay high. Um, you know, for, for a while or forever, you know, I don't know. And the models, the other thing is that going forward, if you look at the projections in the models, um, the climate models, that is, they look uh, like they want to reduce hurricanes in the Atlantic because they get more wind shear because the Pacific looks El Nino-like, sort of permanently in the models right. in the future. And there's now good evidence from some of my colleagues here at Columbia that the models may be wrong about that, that there's a just like you talked about the cone, when you have models that all agree, they could still be wrong. That mm -hmm. could be happening with climate models. The fact that they all go El Nino-like in the Pacific is now understood to be, first of all, at odds with observations. The real Pacific has not done that yet. And it's 20 years ago, and my colleagues, this is uh, Mark Kane and Richard Seeger at Lamont, Amy Clement, who used to be here. She's now been at Miami for 20 years, and you may make more. But they've made, they made this argument 20 years ago, and it's become much more compelling because history has gone their way that it looks more La Nina like than El Nino like and they have a very compelling argument for not just that the models are wrong but why they're wrong and if that's the case the future looks worse for the Atlantic than we have thought and then the, worse than the models are saying so it's a complicated story but 
and and it's and it's tricky because of course it still could be that the number of hurricanes goes down because of global warming. And if that happens, even if they're all stronger and produce more rain, if there's fewer of them, you know what the net risk is is a little tricky to evaluate. So it's not the simplest story. I mean, hurricanes are not the simplest story with climate change. And I think the way I say it is, if you know, it's another precautionary thing. Like if you don't know which way it's going to go, but there's a decent chance things get worse, you know. Plan for it to be worse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, plus yeah. hurricanes are not the only reason to be worried about global warming, and I don't right. think they're the main one. I mean, I think exactly. there's a lot of things that are much more certain, you know, to be bad outcomes. But I think the hurricane story is not, it's, it's not as simple as we don't detect any trend. You hear a lot of our colleagues saying that. I think a lot of us are way too conservative about it. Well, and um, what studying South Florida hurricanes tells you is that, so let's say that uh, it's they're five percent. Let's say they're ten percent stronger, right? I mean, like that's a lot. But let's just say they were. Well, the fact is, big, bad, terrible hurricanes have happened here one after the other, after the other, after the other. seven sure. times in the first seven decades of the twentieth century. The sure. eye of a hurricane came over downtown Miami. The eye seven times in in, in seven right. decades, right? So the fact that that the hurricanes are stronger, you know. Thankfully, we're building better buildings here now on a, yeah. on average. So you, you have multiple things going on. And the, the biggest hurricane problem, bigger than the uh, than the fact that hurricanes are stronger, say, is the fact that we built this mega city sitting right on the water, you yeah. know, a few feet above sea level and piled all yeah. these people in it that couldn't possibly, you know, get out. Uh, and thankfully here in Miami, Dade, and Broward County. We have buildings that will withstand any significant hurricane. People can be safe here, but that's not true anywhere else on the hurricane coast. I mean, that's really the the big problem, and the hurricane yeah. intensification is still kind of in the noise related to that problem. It seems to I me think at this right. point. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I mean, there's two problems, right? It, this is why I like to talk about mitigation and adaptation. When it comes to like one thing is a political crest around global warming, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how big a problem is is it? and how much action should we be as a society be taking? I think it's clear we should be taking much, much more action than we are, and that the reasons we're not are not good reasons, and we have a really uh, you know, unhealthy uh, political debate over it, um, where one side just doesn't want to hear the answer. But, you know, so when it comes to that debate, you know, the question is, are hurricanes part of that story? Are they, and I think the answer is yes, although maybe not the most important part. So that's one thing. If you ask, Okay, now you have people living in the city. How worried should they be about hurricanes and how much is global warming a part of that? Now you're talking about what I would classify as sort of adaptation. And I think you're right. I mean, the global warming signal is, is still at this time small compared to the effects of risky development in coastal areas and, and all that. That may not be true 100 years from now right. or even mm -hmm. 20 years from now, but um, you're, you're right. I mean, you don't need global warming to have a problem. <laughs> to have a big problem. I mean, the problem is sitting here right in, in front of me, right, right here. So um, I, w I wasn't going to go there, but it's such an interesting topic and, and we do need to wrap up. But I want to go back to what you said about the AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, yeah. this idea that we have these eras of more hurricanes and then an era of fewer, era of more, era of fewer going back. So you know, since 1995, clearly there have been more hurricanes in the Atlantic. And from 1969-ish, I guess, to 94, there were fewer in, in numbers. And, and then you go back before that, and it's uh, it gets a little bit murky when when the, the maximum that ended in 69 or so, when did that really start? 26, I guess, was the first year. And then you go back, and it seems like in early in the century there were fewer. But But if you go back into the late, 19th century, it's really hard to figure out what's going on there because the late 19th century was a super busy time. A lot of hurricanes happened, 1886, 1893. I mean, like a lot of hurricanes happened in yeah. big, uh, you know, big landfalling hurricanes. So I've, I've, oh, I've wondered how much proof we have statistically, and I'm not a statistician, statistician so this is totally just uh, my sense of it, that we have, looking back, we think we're in a plus, we had a minus, we can kind of figure out another plus, we can kind of figure out another minus, and then we can't really figure out anything. So 
you know, do we have enough evidence, even though uh, Dr. Bill Gray came up with a perfectly reasonable explanation about the circulation of the earth, uh, of, of the, in the oceans, the, the Gulf Stream going up and the thermal halion circulation and the, uh, the uh, salt and, and uh, the way the salinity uh, increases and decreases and so forth in a cyclical way. It was a perfectly reasonable explanation that I believed, but I just wonder, and, and I've heard exactly the discussion that, that you talked about of the other things that have been going on in the world and changing the atmosphere that might be influencing uh, this change. I just wonder if we really statistically have enough proof to demonstrate that this is a fundamental Earth system, this, this uh, uh, up and down nature of the Atlantic. Right. Um, so I guess, I mean, a, a, a way to paraphrase the question is, you know, is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation really an oscillation in the sense of something that goes back and forth with a well-defined frequency? Yeah, or even and, if we um, can't pin exactly the frequency, at least it goes back and forth over, you know, we've said for, for a long time, 25 to 40 years, right? Sounds yeah. like sounds like a, a pretty rough yeah. I mean, I mean, the first thing is that, you know, the hurricanes pretty much track with the sea surface temperature. So... You don't only have to look at the hurricanes, you can look at the sea right. surface temperature, mm -hmm. and that gives you a little more data, you know, going back a little further. It's still, you know, you go back hundreds of years and it still gets pretty murky, but mm -hmm. there is some evidence there. I, I don't really, I'm not really prepared to make the argument about how well-defined the frequency is and whether it's truly an oscillation or not. There's clearly variability at that time scale in the Atlantic mm -hmm. climate system in a way that there doesn't seem to be in the other basins. And it is, does seem to be because the thermohaline circulation is by far an Atlantic creature. I mean, there mm -hmm. isn't the same kind of right. thermohaline circulation in the Pacific, for example. And in the Indian Ocean, it can't because this you know, land blocks it. But, um, but the other thing is that um, my understanding, and I'm not super up to date on this, but my understanding from not too long ago is that also coupled climate models do do it. I mean, the better ones do makes do have some degree of internal variability at that frequency, whether it's a true oscillation with what we call a spectral peak, meaning a well-defined frequency, mm -hmm. you know, may vary, but they clearly do want to do it. I think, um, you know, but you're right. I mean, going if you want to do it by just empirically and counting the ups and downs, we don't have very many. So it's not very satisfying. I think there's some paleo evidence, you know, for very, you know, strong variability in thermohaline mm -hmm. thermo circulation. It's it's thought to be, you know, changes in the thermohaline circulation are thought to be important to a lot of um, uh, fluctuations in the ice ages, and, uh, for example, and, and rapid climate changes in the in the geologic record. Um, I think the again, I think a, a really really important question we have to answer now is not so much, you know, how, what would happen in the unperturbed system? I mean, how, how pure of an oscillation would we have versus what are we seeing now? And right. And if it did exist, does it, has the climate, the, the evolution of the climate actually changed it, even if it did exist? Right? Well, I, the way I would phrase it, I think of the hypothesis I now believe the most and I think there's still healthy, you know, this is not a totally settled question by any means. There's, you know, I'm not voicing, it may, may or may not even be a majority opinion, but it's certainly, a, a, I think, opinion that has a lot of support and is held by many people that there may well be a natural oscillation, a natural mode of variability, but we are now forcing it, you know, mm -hmm. we're hitting it with radiative forcing, and so that forcing projects on the natural mode of the system. So it's like, a, you know, the bell may ring naturally because the wind blows, but if you whack it, you know, it's going to ring when you choose to whack it. And right. so, you know, we're, it is a force system and the relative roles of the natural internal dynamics and the, and the forcing is, to me, is really the critical question for knowing what's going to happen in the future. Right. I, I agree. I agree. And we're, you know, all the fresh water that's being dumped in the North Atlantic by the melting glaciers and so forth. How, how does that change things, uh, you know, in amongst the warming of the earth and, so forth. Anyway, to me, it's fascinating. It'd be great. That, you know, I think you need a graduate student on that uh, subject or, or several <laughs> well, of them. To me, it's a, it is a... There are, but they don't work for me. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, Adam, let's, uh, let's leave it there. This is officially by far our longest podcast, and we could go on 
for oh, a long okay. time, I can tell. But thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adam Sobel of Columbia University. Appreciate having you here. Thank you so much, Brian. My pleasure. Wow, that was fun. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Dr. Adam Sobel, professor in physics and math and environmental science at Columbia University. That set a record for our longest podcast, and I felt like we could have talked for uh, another hour easy. That was great. All right, next week on the podcast, we have another great one. This is Dr. Louis Uccellini is going to be with us. He's the director of the National Weather Service. Louis has a tremendous background in many facets of meteorology. Everybody in the meteorology business knows Louis has been around a long time, almost as long as me, and a perspective on the science of meteorology and the practical aspects of forecasting the daily weather and warning for extreme weather that few other people have. He leads the organization that makes possible what all of us in the weather business do every day. So I hope you'll join us next week for a conversation with Dr. Louis Uccellini. I can't wait for that. That's it for this week. For Luke Doris, I'm Brian Norcross. As always, we'll see you on Local 10 in South Florida or on Local10.com anywhere you punch up Local10.com. Be well, stay safe, and wear a mask, please. Thank you.